Bonjour tout le monde. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, nice being here. Uh, the fact that you're in this room, basically, the fact that you're at this event means that you love performance. We all love performance. But actually, I really, really love performance. And not only during my day job at Akamai, where I make our customers' websites as fast as possible, but also in the evening when I go home, my wife um, is watching television and my kids are in bed. I pick my laptop and I work on the largest scale modeling website in the world. Now, what does, this, what does that have to do with performance? It's not only the largest scale modeling website in the world, it's also the fastest one. So here you see the crux data, all the core web vitals we discussed many uh, times today. And first thing is, why should you bother? Because the core web vitals and the goal, everybody's goal is P75, P75, P75. And what we basically say is, the if the P75 is good, then excellent, great job, applaud yourself. And But is P75 actually good enough? If you ask the SEO team, they say yes. It doesn't matter if you have 85, 86, 91, 92, 75 is basically good enough. But if you look at it from a user experience perspective, if you say that 75% of the user experience is good, what does it also mean? That 25% is not good. Or one out of four, which is not ideal. So this talk is all about how to get beyond the P75 and some of the techniques I used to get there. And how to get there? We'll look at 90th percentile, 95th, 98th, 99th. I'll leave that up to you. Now there are in theory three things you need to do to get there. You have the basics, and then we'll look at some design choices I made from the beginning, as well as some cool and advanced techniques you might also apply on your websites. I know nobody of you has a scale modeling website, which is fine. Just what is key is before you start with the advanced stuff, make sure that the basics are right. And so what I will not cover today is things like 103 early hints. Yes, I preload my fonts. Yes, I broadly compress my resources. Yes, I add fetch priority high. Yes, I enable HTTP3. Of course, I work for a CDN. I also implement a CDN. So these are all the basics and they matter. Mm. But because this is an advanced talk and we're already at the end of the conference, we'll just dive into the fun stuff. Yes, thank you. Um, so two big blocks here, uh, some of the design choices, and then we'll look at fresh techniques, mainly to improve CLS, LCP, and then a little bit of INP, because there were already many talks on INP, so I reduced that a little. Can double check, everybody can hear me in the back as well? Good, excellent. So pushing the limits, I made some design choices. When I started the website in 2011, this is how the page looked. You went to the website and then I used Google AdSense to have advertising revenue and you have like plenty of requests to ad servers and some fonts are added, third parties are added. This is basically crazy. Um, some other stuff as well. Now, 13 years later, I'm no longer that naive person I, with GDPR, what I basically said is rather than having all these third parties destroy the performance of my website and destroy the user experience, I decided to not throw away advertising because that's how I make money. I actually went for a fully in-house solution based on Revive open source ad server, doesn't matter. Key thing here is you just see only one domain and actually a little bit of Ampulse, which is my run data. But other than that, everything is on the same domain. So that just gives you some great performance benefits in general. 13 years ago, it's a long time ago, I was young, a little bit naive, and back then still developing in PHP. And back then, multi-page app was still almost the only thing. Sorry? A website. A website, yes, a website, a website. Now. 13 years later, a lot happened. New frameworks, even better frameworks, better frameworks, better frameworks, and my decision was still to basically upgrade my PHP version to the latest version, which takes five minutes, and it's still a multi-page app. And I think that's a crucial decision because all of the problems we see today is mainly because of, or many of the problems are linked to single-page apps. So that's why I stay with that. Now, 
That's the design choices. And this gives me already a head start. Now let's look at some key things we can implement as well. So first we'll look at CLS, then LCP, and then at the end we'll finish with IMP. Now CLS is actually my favorite core web vital. Why? Because in my view it's the easiest to tune and it's the best to actually see user experience. And what I don't like about the CLS course is that in order to have a good value, you can have a CLS of 0 0.100. Now, I don't know if you have seen a page where with 0 to 100, it's like shifting like crazy. I don't consider that a good user experience at all. Another reason why I like CLS is because it does not depend on the device you use. It does not depend on the location of the user. It does not depend if it's like if you have like a lot of marketing teams or if you're using Google Tag Manager. CLS is fully under control of the developers. You can just look at a website and if nothing move if something moves, in my view, you need to fix it. So actually I'm a big fan of going for a score of 0 0.0000, no layout shifts at all, because that will give you the best feeling from an end user experience. We can debate about, oh, is LCP 50 milliseconds faster? Will the user notice? No. If you remove a single layout shift, everybody will notice. And just to prove my point, here is a layout shift likely happening on many of your websites of 0 0.002. So you should have 50 of those before cro the Google says, hey, this is not good user experience. Have a close look. So, like many things, the, the website renders and I have a very fast FCP, so something is painted on the screen. A little bit later, the rest of the content arrives. Who spotted the shift? Yes, let's go, let's go another one. Content arrives, look at the logo, content arrives. One more, let me explain what happens, and some of you already noted, is the page renders fast, and everything is central, centra, um, centralized in the center. At this point in time, there is not enough content for the scroll bar to show up. And the scroll bar is like 10 pixels. Now, a little bit later, more content arrives, and then you basically tell the browser, dear browser, now you need to recalculate everything at that scroll bar. And the solution to this is one rule of CSS, which basically tells, dear browser, whenever you start rendering the page, show that scroll bar all the time. That's basically it. That's one annoying layout shift. And if you remove this one, and if, uh, then if you go from one page to the other, it will also feel a lot faster. Next, ad blockers. Ad blockers, why do people use them? Because they typically improve performance. That's one of the main reasons ad blockers exist. Now, on my website, actually ad blockers delay Regrade performance. Let me show you. So this is the page, and everything adds, uh, everything loads, and then a little bit later the ads arrive. And because I'm smart, and because I don't like CLS, I added some placeholders so that nothing shifts around. How do you do that? You just add some width and height in your CSS. Nothing special. Now, what is the problem? When you a user installs an ad blocker, and depending on which one. What happens is the page renders lightning fast and then the ad blocker kicks in and removes the ad slots. And you see two layout shifts, one at the top and one on the sidebar. Everything moves up. Not good for user experience. And depending on how fast it loads and the network conditions, you can either see it or you don't see it. What was my solution? Well, just add a wrapper class around the ad container and give that a width and a height. And if then the ad blocker kicks in and removes the ad slot, the container is still there and nothing shifts around. Very easy. And why? Because this was actually a quite big layout shift happen. Next thing, HTML streaming. I know some of the modern frameworks now say, hey, we do HTML streaming. I stream since more than 10 years, nothing special there for a multi-page app. And just to show you, and this 
was a small issue, but I actually noted it on certain pages, is the page renders here very fast. Now you need to look at the top right corner. A little bit later, the menu and the rest of the content arrives. Now there are two layout shifts which happened here. A, the select box, which with all sections, is shifted to the left. Why? Because a little bit later, the text area and the input button arrived, and because I do text align right, that's what you basically get. The other thing is, if you look at the width of the select box, that's a second layout shift. Why is that? Because a little bit later, an additional option in the select box was streamed, and the browser said, hey, I ha need more space. If you're looking at the HTML at the exact point in time when that first screenshot is made, basically this is what the browser got. Instructions and then here inst, and then the rest of the bytes. Stop. Now, how did I fix that? I like extreme minification. So body class BGL with two quotes, it's two wasted bytes because you can remove the quotes and it's still the same. Now, why does it matter here? Because if I did this, what happened? I actually saw two characters. That's because based on how the streaming worked, some kind of buffer was filled or not filled. So, while my wife was watching Grey's Anatomy, I basically picked my laptop and tried to squeeze off as many bytes as possible, but that, was, that helped a bit, but not entirely. So, if you look at where a lot, a lot of content exists on your websites, it's in the head section. There is crazy amount of data there. And actually, Harry Roberts did a, an excellent talk on this, 45 minutes just on this subject. I su um, uh, suggest you to look at it. The order in your head matters, all these things. But key here is, my view, we ship too much data, which your users don't care about, but which just the crawlers care about, or which just the bots, like Facebook and Twitter, care about. Just as an example, my website is translated in 20 languages, and hreflang is like the way in the SEO world to say, hey, this is the French version, this is the German version, this is the Dutch version, and this is like a huge amount of data. And yes, I know this gzips well, but still, it's a lot of data. Now, why would you ship this to millions and millions of page views? by your real users if the only one reading this is Google and Yandex and other search engines. And actually the solution is quite simple. You can also include this information in your site maps. So rather than shipping this to your end users, just remove it from your pages and add it to your site map. Same information, same impact from an SEO perspective, and you're not wasting bytes. Another thing is OG image, OG title, Twitter tag, all that stuff, we ship like crazy. They consume bytes for no reason. And in my case, these additional bytes resulted in that select box not being complete, resulted in that um, text area not being there and the button not being there. So removing all those uh, things. Now, and just as an example, for logged in users, this is how my head looks. No description tag. Who cares about the description tag? No keywords. No other stuff which just are consumed by bots. Send the least amount of data. Now, this might be a complex exercise. Luckily, there is something new available to us. And that's called link rel expect, then an ID, and blocking equals render. Now, what does this do? Here you can see on my page, I added this in the head section, and the href points to the ID of a resource of a container on your page. And here is my ID. And what is this basically saying? Dear browser, don't even try to render this element or the rest on the page before this element is completely, completely available, downloaded, and parsed meaning that layout shift, uh, that header, which was when it was incomplete, I would rather have an, my FCP a little bit later and show a nice rendering rather than having the CLS. Of course, if you add this on your footer, 
then you would not see anything at all until the footer arrives. So be careful with uh, this. But adding this basically ro I removed all the issues with CLS in the head section. All right. CLS frequency. Oh, those colors are really bad. But basically, good is still good, and my expected value is zero. And I don't care if the value is 0 0.002 or 0 0.005. It's annoying for the end users. So I like to look at CLS frequency. What is, for a specific page, the amount of layout shifts which are seen? For example, on the home page, it might be zero, no layout shifts at all. On my search page, I had 5%, 10% of the page use having a CLS. Then I know what to fix. So my mantra for CLS is aim for zero. And you, in theory, everybody can do it. You don't need an expensive CDN. You don't need image formats. You can go there. Now, I know some of you are looking a little bit with a critical look. Aim for zero, and Tim, 0 0.1% poor. Like, why is that? Why am I really that me? And I'm, I'm a bad developer, and the answer is yes. But the thing is, we're still with real users, and it's the wild, wild web. So when I looked at my run data, I could actually spot that the issue is because I have one user using Edge 85, which has some CLS issues. And each time he visits the website, my CLS frequency goes up. When he goes on holiday and doesn't visit the website, it's there. So I know it's on YouTube, but Pierre, if you live, uh, Pierre who lives in Bordeaux in uh, Rue de l'Atlantique, please upgrade your browser so this is fixed. That was CLS. Next key thing is LCP or largest contentful paint with the well-known values. And what are, what are you think? What is critical for a scale modeling website? What is typically the LCP element? Will it be a font or an image? Image, yes, because scale modelers like to present their models, big pictures, etc. So let's have a look at a few things I did for images and LCP. Of course, I have a responsive website. It's 2024. Now, what I did is I s selected the breakpoints for my responsive images in a careful way. So I'm using the picture element, and here you see that based on the dimensions and the device pixel ratio, the right image is loaded. Nothing special here. However, if you look at the pattern, what do you see? That the 540 pixel image is reused. The 720 pixels image is basically reused for a mobile device with 2x, but is also used on a desktop device with only 1x. And reuse, reuse, reuse. Now why would that matter? Cache fragmentation, that's an excellent. So the first thing is I don't need to generate that many images in my backend. Mm, that's one thing. The other thing is CDN efficiency. Because the more versions you have of an image, the fewer the chance is that that image is actually in cache. If you know I have more than one million different products in the database, so some of these contents are almost rarely, rarely seen. If on top of that I would explode the amount of images I have, the chance that I reuse the CDN cache is small. And just as an example, here you see the amount of hits of that. This is now a popular product, the amount of hits. And clearly see that 720 is the most popular object. But if you're looking at the bottom, you see that 540 and 360 are rarely requested. Now, one of the things I'm now evaluating is, should I get rid of my 360 pixels version and just ship by default the 540 pixel version? And why is that? Is it faster to serve the 540 pixels image from cache and sending too many bytes versus having a cache miss on that 360 pixels version going all the way back to my server in Germany. And if you're here in Nantes, it's likely okay. I have users in Australia. So the question is, what is the performance? So I will likely remove, based on this data, I will likely remove that smallest thing. Remember, in the beginning, I shave off bytes, I shave off bytes, 
and some of you might say, Tim, why do you use the picture element? Remember that picture element was crazy amount of bytes, plenty of DOM elements. Why can't I just use this? A lot simpler, a lot cleaner, a lot easier to maintain. There is one big problem here. There is no DPR capping. So what will the browser do? It will, let's actually have a look. If you have a Samsung phone, mo a modern Samsung phone, the viewport is 360 pixels. But the device pixel ratio of some of these devices is 4x or even more. Which image is selected by the browser? It's 360 times 4, and then the next, big, uh, the closest one. So in this case, it matches the 1440 pixels. Now, if that Samsung phone is on the train from Paris to Nantes, and you're on 3G, 4G, and you need to download a 1440 pixels image, that is likely too much. And with the previous one, I was able to fixate and say, hey, don't chart, don't load images which are larger than 2x. Next is wrong LCP candidates. And just quick, by now everybody should know what is the LCP element here? The big product picture in the middle. Hmm. Now, I have a lot of user generated content, uh, so scale models all over the world, they maintain the database and they upload pictures. Now, while I can ask them to upload big pictures, sometimes they add. They might just have a smaller picture of that product. Now, what is the LCP element in this case? It's the banner. Now, what is the problem with banners? They are late discovered, because for the banner to check, I first need to run the JavaScript. Yes, it's local. Yes, it's all fast but it still takes some time. The banners are discovered late, and that's the LCP element. So there are two options I have. A is ask, nudge my users, can you please upload a bigger picture? And basically by adding more bytes, I would make my LCP faster. That's the best from a user experience perspective because everybody likes big pictures. Now, I can nudge them, I can't force them. I would rather have a small image, then no image at all. And that's why I introduced a technique, and I call that fast fallback banner. And it's exactly doing that. It's fast, and it's a fallback uh, banner. And what is basically, it's an early discovered image. When I render my page, when I generate my page on the server using PHP, I know the dimensions of the image which will be included, so I calculate the size, and if it's below a certain value, then I know, oh, I don't want to show the real ad. I fall back to a default ad. And that could, for example, be a coffee, mu coffee mug of Scalemates. Or could be a, um, let's say, an event I sponsor where I just show these, those banners. So on those locations, I don't care about the correct amount of impressions. I don't care about the correct amount of uh, money. It's basically free ads which are then run. Easy, but it's a great way. Everybody still with me? Nobody fell asleep? Thank you very much. Uh, so now let's look at the next thing. So we looked at HTML. Uh, sorry, we looked at images. Now what is the next big thing which impacts your performance and your LCP is the HTML. Now I have an international audience. Uh, so not just France, not just Germany, not just Belgium. Brazil, Australia, New Zealand, basically everywhere around the world. And my server is in Germany, Frankfurt. And when I looked at my run data, I could basically see that if you're far away from Germany, then the performance degrades. Mm. Uh, what is bad here? Australia, very bad. Japan, very bad. Nothing special. And the reason is simple. If there is I use a CDN, but if there is a cache miss, I need to go all the way back to Frankfurt. Now, why would I worry about this when I have a CDN? Mm. First problem is I have more than one million page views, uh, pages. They are translated in 16 languages. That's 16 million pages. I run, of course, A-B testing, so that's basically 32 million pages. People can log in. And if you're logged in, you can't hit the Akamai cache. 
and I have some extreme long tail content which nobody looks at maybe once every week. So the chance that I hit the Akamai cache or the CDN cache is too small. And then you have this performance. So what was the solution? Quite easy. What would happen, and this is the first test I did, is why can't I set up a replica of my database and a replica of my application, small one, not everything, in Australia? And at the CDN, I basically said, if users are from Australia and New Zealand, rather than going all the way back to Frankfurt, just go to Australia. So this is the result for my product detail pages. Now, I only did this for anonymous users. I only did this under, uh, for certain pages, but this is key. Now, this looks nice, and I did the same thing in Japan, very similar, the same thing, et cetera, et cetera. So short, very short story. Right now, if you visit Scalemates, depending on where you are in the world and which pages you visit, you hit a data center close to you. Now, in theory, if I would go to all the Akamai cloud locations, which are available, I would even add more. Now, this actually degrades my performance. Why would that be? Cache fragmentation, yes. So there is not only network latency, because if you bring your server closer to the end user, you win network latency, let's say 20 milliseconds. But my application also has caching. If you do two times the same query on your database, the second one will be faster. I have memcached, etc. cetera. So I, if I fragment too much, I win a little bit of additional milliseconds, but I might lose 100, 200 milliseconds on the application layer because there I have cache misses. Just this also not only works for real users, this is also for Google. So Google, the bot is in West, US West Coast. So here you see when I deployed um, first in East Coast and then West Coast that I shaved off 150 milliseconds just for the crawler. And it's not only about Core Web Vitals. I have search facets, and if you click on those filters, they are not measured by LCP. They are not measured by Google but it's a critical portion of my application. So if I can make those 90 milliseconds faster, that's, yeah, that really changes the behavior. All right, another reason websites can be slow are redirects. And redirects are really stupid. Very often they are very, very stupid. And you can avoid them, that's one thing, but at some point in time you just have all the URLs linking around user forums, and in the meantime, the SEO team decided that that link changes. And the solution to that is actually quite simple, a technique called redirect liquidation. Liquidation meaning killing the redirect. Mm. Um, and what is the solution? Let's say a user requests the old URL, clicks on the forum, and see old URL. When that request for the old URL hits my server, Rather than just sending, hey, dear user, here is the new URL, if I know the new URL, I might as well generate the content of the new URL. So that's what the user sees. They see the new URL, and they get a 200. Now, where is the magic? They not only see the new content, they also see the new URL in the address bar. Otherwise, it should just be a forward rewrite, and in this case, it's redirect liquidation. So what is the magic? Request hits, the, hits my uh, backend, I generate the correct page, I return a 200, but how do I get the address bar to change? JavaScript is always bad, just in this case, it's not. What do I do? I basically say, dear browser, please change the URL in your menu bar from the old one to the new one. Now, history replace state, the only thing it does is it changes the URL. It doesn't do any requests. Now, I know many of you, oh, Tim, 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 redirects, Google needs to know redirects. Uh, whatever, otherwise, your content will always stay in Google with the old URLs, I fully agree. You only do this when you're sure that it's not a crawler. Your real users, they don't care about redirect. They don't, they basically ignore it. If I think it's Google or even suspect it's a bot, I de deactivate this feature. 
and that's it. So here you see the amount of the amount of redirects I had on a single day. So I removed plenty of them. There are many techniques. And then at some point in time, I implemented uh, redirect liquidation. And you see I have just a few redirects left. Now, why is it not zero? Because it only works for same domain redirects and same um, HTTP versus HTTPS. So if somebody hits scalemates.com without the dub dub dub, that still needs to be a redirect because history replace state does not work with that. If somebody visits HTTP, that will not uh, that will not work. That's the reason. All right, fifteen minutes to go. What is the easiest way to improve performance? Is cache your HTML in the browser. Now, caching static resources is super easy. Cache your CSS for 365 days. If you need a new one, you just add a version number. If you have a new image, just rename it. That's fine. HTML files, you can't rename. So let's take this fake example. A user visits nine pages. Page A, page B, page C. And at some point in time, you see that page B is requested a second time. And page A is also requested a second time. Because I added max H of 600 seconds, you basically serve them from cache. So these two files would be lightning fast. That's all easy. But the problem starts here. On my website, users can also log in. Say, hey, I'm Tim, and I want this model. This is on my wish list. This is how I manage my collection. And what is the problem? If users already have objects in their cache and then log in, let's say I log in between page four and five, and next I visit page A, what happens? The user sees the cached page and thinks they are logged out. And I don't know, but when I deploy this to production, my users yelled at me, they emailed me, they messaged me on Facebook, they messaged me on WhatsApp, they even faxed me. They basically were very, very unhappy because while I care about performance, this is very, very, very bad user experience because they said, oh, let's log out, let's log in again, and they did crazy things. Luckily, this problem goes away, and it only happens during what I call the RLI, or recently logged in risk zone, which basically depends on how long you cache your HTML. If you cache your HTML for 10 seconds, after 10 seconds, that problem is gone. So one solution is reduce the TTL, reduce the TTL, two seconds, one second. I reduce the problem, but sometimes it will still there. On the other hand, if you cache for two seconds, what is the chance that, two user, that a user visits the same page within two seconds? Zero. Mm. So, some of you might say, hey Tim, I know this header called clear site data cache. If you add this HTTP response header, for example, just after your login, you basically tell the browser, dear browser, delete the browser cache for this website. First problem is, it deletes the entire browser cache. So also your CSS, JavaScript images, which might already be loaded, which in theory is reasonable, and also the HTML. That solves the problem. The only problem is it's slow. Here you see the LCP, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, 60 seconds. And this was mainly on slow devices where just clearing the local cache from disk takes time. And nobody likes to wait 45 seconds before they actually see something on screen. So hence, I found a new way, and it's called RLI BCB, or Recently Logged In Browser Cache Bypassing. I'm sorry for the name, but the solution is quite simple. When the user log in, logs in, I add a cookie saying, hey, this user just logged in. And I let's say it's valid for 15 minutes. When the user hits my origin, rather than generating links by default, I append an additional query string RLI equals one. Meaning that any versions in cache 
don't have that query string parameter. So each time they click on a link within that 15 minutes, I bypass anything potentially in the browser cache. Now, users don't like to see RLI equals one in the browser bar, so I use the same technique, history replace state, and I remove that RLI equals one. And this works like a charm, and because of that, I can now cache my HTML for 60 minutes in the browser. All right. Last, oh no, not last but not least, but almost last but not least. Progressive speculation rules. Um, and I actually hope that Barry Pollard from Google would actually have been here to talk about what speculation rules are. So I will quickly do that, although it's in theory basics, it's nothing special, but it's still new. And then I will look at a technique I call progressive speculation rules. So this was introduced by uh, Barry, who is now sitting in the other room. Uh, at Google I.O. and actually shared um, some of the things I did. For example, here at the bottom you see that I was able to improve my LCP with 500 milliseconds at the P95, just by implementing speculation rules. And what is speculation rules? It, in, it promises you nearly instant performance. And here you see 80 milliseconds LCP when the user navigates on your website. I actually have, my record is 24 milliseconds but typically it's, let's say, if everything goes well, around 80 milliseconds. And the only thing you need to do is inject this little JSON snippet on your page. And what does this JSON snippet say? It say, what do you need to um, speculate on? So that can be either hard-coded URLs or in this case, uh, CSS selectors. It tells you what the action is you want the browser to do. So either prefetch, this will request the HTML just the HTML early on and put them in the prefetch cache. And then the action pre-render will actually take the HTML, parse the HTML, run all the JavaScript, call all the images, call all the fonts, and basically have the page ideally fully ready. And the moment the user clicks, all the work is already done. And then you can also instruct the browser how eager, when do you want to do this? And do you really want to be sure? before starting the pre-rendering, or do you really want to do it aggressively? And just here you see the default one. When a user clicks, the HTML just requested some images, LCP happens, nothing special here. When you pre-fetch with eagerness conservative, when the user clicks on the link, has uh, basically when the mouse goes down, in this case, Chrome will actually already trigger the HTML. While the user has not clicked yet, it will trigger this request a little bit earlier. When you go for eagerness moderate, when the user hovers over a link, not instantly, 200 milliseconds, that's likely a big chance that the user will click. You're still not sure. That request, that HTML is already requested. If you do pre-render, same thing, only difference is that now also the images, the CSS, the page is actually requested and executed in the background. And in the bottom example, you see that when the user then actually clicks, everything is, your LCP is instant. Of course, this depends on the time you have between the actual click and when you start the pre-rendering and when you start the hovering. So in this case, you see that when the user clicks a little bit faster, LCP is still a lot faster, but not yet instant. In case your website is a little bit slower and your HTML takes more time, it's still a great way for pr improving performance, but it's no longer instant. So that's why I came up with a technique which I call progressive pre-rendering. Uh, uh, pre and what is the thing? Here, I actually do it in two steps. On hover, I trigger the pre-fetch instantly. Not using speculation rules, just using JavaScript. And there are like there is Insta page from a French uh, performance consultant also available who can do that. And then I use the speculation rules to actually start the pre-rendering. But the benefit is the HTML is already there. And that's what how I implemented it now on my website. Uh, you can also do it moderate is basically I trigger the HTML when I hover over the link instantly. 200 milliseconds later, I trigger the pre-rendering. And this gives you really, really nice performance. I will skip that. And then last but not least, 
INP. Many talks on INP today. And the only thing I can say here is, <laughs> yes. Um, now, to finish, while you now might think, oh, Tim, this, this guy is like a little bit crazy, 98, 99, is that really needed? And while I love web performance, in the end, it's all about the user experience. And for example, last year, I made a change to the website and I increased the size of my images because that's what people come for to my website and the bigger images, the better user experience. I basically decided I'm my website is fast enough so I can actually degrade the performance a bit to increase the user experience. Another thing is a new technique now for multi-page apps which is available is view transitions. If you really purely look at the LCP, um, at the LCP value, you will see that view transitions delays, that if it's instant 25 milliseconds with view transitions, it will be 125 milliseconds. Now, in theory, you could say, hey, that's a lot slower, but from an end user perspective, this feels faster, this looks nicer, the navigation looks nicer. So, yes, try to improve your performance, but also don't be too blind for the numbers alone. And that brings me to the end of my talk. We all love speed. Even if, you don't, if you're happy with the P75, that's fine. That's already the start. But I hope that at least for some of you, I gave some um, ideas to go beyond the P75. Maybe not the P99 like I do, but that's okay. So with that, I would say thank you very much for your time. Merci beaucoup pour votre temps. And if you have any questions, you can ask them now. You can also ask them in French, and I'll just translate them on the fly. Merci. Any questions? Est-ce qu'il y a des questions? Yes, there is one. Merci. Circulation uh, rules on uh, on SPA on single page application. So the question is, can you use speculation rules on a single page application? The answer is no. That's the easy answer. Um, in your if you in your single page application, so the soft navigations will not work. But very often in your single page application, you do have some hard navigations. If you go from one section to the other, for example, in those cases. Um, uh, it would work, but in general, speculation rules is only for multi-page apps. Thank you. Any additional questions? Yes. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, do you mind to show us again the the little script to replace the parameters into the URLs? Please? Yes. Uh, <laughs> we'll take a photo. Oh yeah, sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, and I will also share the slides with uh, after the conference, so um, then you can re-look at it at your own okay. pace. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, for, <laughs> <laughs> for regarding the script, is it okay for SEO? Uh, I mean, uh, oh, Googlebot. Uh, yeah, yeah. There, yeah. So SEO is always a different, uh, um, and there, in my view, uh, so I have I have this now on my website since more than two years. Uh, because some people say, hey, you're serving different content to Google Bot than to the end user. Mm. Um, and I fully agree that you should never do that. Uh, let's say if, it's, is if the idea is to uh, fool Google in the other way, the other way around. Um, from an end user perspective, everybody still sees the same content and the final result is still uh, the same. And in my view, it's a bit the same as I do also A-B testing, and if I do A-B testing, the content is also a little bit different. So in my view, there is no issue. The only thing you should be aware of that make sure that when Googlebot comes, send them the redirect, so you actually send them the, that they update their index.
but that's the only thing. So I don't see an issue with SEO, but SEO teams can have different opinions on that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Merci. Any additional questions? If not, thank you very much for your time. Merci beaucoup.